So our, our next presentation here on the topic of authorities uh, comes from uh, the, the National Marine Fisheries Service on the topic of roles and responsibilities. And, and we have, I think, some combination of Noah Silverman and David Dale for this. So I'll set off to you, Noah. Thank you, Eric. My name is Noah Silverman. I'm the National Environmental Policy Act for NOAA Fisheries in the Southeast region. And I help us uh, coordinate our involvement in major infrastructure projects throughout the Southeast. Uh, between David Dale and myself, we will be uh, tag teaming as the point of contact for this intergovernmental task force. And uh, I plan to go over today our roles and responsibilities for offshore wind development in the Gulf. Next slide, please. So, um, NOAA Fisheries, uh, we work to, to fulfill our mission through science-based conservation and management and the promotion of healthy e ecosystems. Next slide. In the Southeast region, uh, our region, this is the geographical extent of the Southeast region. It covers 20,000 miles of coastline, uh, eight coastal states, nine inland states, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Our regional office, which is where the regulatory programs are housed, is, is based out of St. Petersburg. Next slide, please. Our Southeast Fishery Science Center, which shares the same geographic extent of, as the regional office, is housed and based out of Miami. Next slide. Our roles and responsibilities related to offshore wind, NOAA Fisheries advises comments and provides conservation recommendations through NEPA, through Magnuson-Stevens Act and Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act. We'll prepare a biological opinion uh, for the Endangered Species Act, uh, any incidental take authorizations for under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and play a, uh, inter, a role in interagency coordination under the FAST Act. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Under NEPA, due to our special extra expertise and jurisdiction by law, we will likely serve as a cooperating agency for the development of NEPA documents for wind, for wind energy. Uh, we'll provide input on purpose and need, range of alternatives, and if applicable, may even be an adopting agency for any authorizations necessary under the MMPA. Next slide, please. Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act is the signature act guiding the management of fisheries in federal waters. It created the regional fishery management councils. Uh, it focuses on maximum sustainable yield. NIMS strategic goals in implementing the Magnuson-Stevens Act include maximizing fisher opportunities while ensuring the sustainability of fisheries and fishing communities. To meet these goals for wind development, we need an understanding of impacts of wind projects to fishery resources, including fishing activities and fishing communities. And we plan to provide comments related to fisheries and fishing communities under the NEPA process. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Magnuson-Stevens Act recognizes that habitat loss is one of the greatest long-term threats to commercial and recreational fisheries. Uh, to address these concerns, the Magnuson-Stevens Act established requirements for conserving essential fish habitat. Essential fish habitat is defined as waters and substrate necessary for, to fish for spawning, breeding, feeding, or growth to maturity. Essentially, all habitat necessary for managed species to complete their life cycle. It includes both waters and substrate, not just the bottom habitats. It includes the water column. And it includes and it can include prey as a part of the uh, essential feeding ha feeding habitat. Next slide, please. Federal action agencies notify NOAA of the proposed activity that may adversely affect essential fish habitat. An adverse effect equals any action that reduces the quantity or quanti quality of essential fish habitat. Consultation initiated is initiated when a complete Essential fish habitat is assessment is submitted. Uh, for offshore wind, uh, these are these actions are likely to be considered substantial 
and will likely require expanded consultation, which will be about 60 days, at which time uh, no fisheries will provide an EFH conservation recommendation. Federal action agencies are required to respond to those recommendations within 30 days. Next slide, please. The Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act. Under the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act, we work to protect, conserve, and enhance species and habitats for a wide range of aquatic resources, such as shellfish, diadromous species, and other commercially and rec recreationally important species that are not managed by the Federal Fishery Management Councils. Next slide, please. The Endangered Species Act. Under Section 7, which is interagency cooperation, each federal agency shall ensure that any action authorized, funded, or carried out is not likely to jeopardize the continued existence of any endangered, threatened species or destroy ad or adversely modify their critical habitat. Section 9 of the Endangered Species Habit Act prohibit prohibits the take of listed species. The Section 7 consultation process provides a means for an exemption from the Section 9 prohibitions through the issuance of an incidental take statement. Take under the Endangered Species Act is defined as to harm, harass, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect, or attempt to engage in any such conduct. <clears throat> the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act do require coordination between the two acts. When there's a marine mammal uh, that's also protected under the Endangered Species Act, um, we cannot issue an incidental take statement for that species unless there is an authorization granted under the marine mammal for that take. Next slide, please. Under ESA Section 7 consultation, there's two types of consultations. The informal consultations occur when a project may affect, but is not likely to adversely affect a threatened or endangered species. Formal consultation is required when a proposed project may affect and is likely to adversely affect a threatened or endangered species or its critical habitat. Consultation is initiated with a written consultation request and the initiation package will include a biological assessment that has includes a description of the action and action area. Uh, e, any of the ESA listed species and critical habitat that are potentially affected. Co any conclusions about those impacts. And it may also include measures to minimize or monitor impacts of the, of the activity. Uh, the consultation begins once NIMS uh, determines that all the information is necessary to complete that consultation and the BIOP will be issued within 135 days. Next slide, please. The BIOP answers the question of whether the proposed action is likely to jeopardize the continued existence of a listed species or result in the destruction or adverse mod modification of a designated critical habitat. The biological opinion is comprehensive. It covers the entire length of the project from construction to decommissioning. All federal actions associated with a single project are considered under the biological opinion. It may also include incidental take statement with mandatory and reasonable prudent measures and terms and conditions. And an, and an incidental take statement can only be issued when a no jeopardy determination is reached. Next slide, please. The Marine Mammal Protection Act. The Marine Mammal Protection Act defines take as to harass, hunt, capture, or kill, or attempt to harass, hunt, capture, or kill any marine mammal. NIMS authorizes incidental take if taking would be of small numbers, of no more than a negligible impact, and not have an unmitigable adverse Im impact. Next slide, please. Two types of incidental take authorizations uh, under the MMPA are the incidental harassment authorization, and that's for activities that are only expected to result in harassment. This process usually takes six to nine months. 
And then there's letters of authorization. These are for activities that may result in serious injury or, mor or mortality. Take may only be authorized through a, an, a letter of authorization uh, and it's effective for only up to five years. Um, and the LOA generally takes 12 to 18 months process to, to receive. Uh, the applicants decide whether or not they apply for an IHA for an incidental harassment authorization or a letter of authorization. Uh, most authorizations for activities that result in harassment uh, due to underwater noise related to offshore wind, and those are like examples of that are high resolution geophysical surveys and pile driving and construction activities. Next slide, please. Issuance of an incidental take authorization is a major federal action that also triggers the, the National Environmental Policy Act and ES Endangered Species Act compliance. Um, NOAA Fisheries will be a co-action agency on the biological opinion if we're going to be issuing uh, an incidental take authorization. And NOAA Fisheries may adopt the BOEMS NEPA document and may also be a co-signatory on the record of decision. Next slide, please. FAST 41 coordination, uh, Title 41 of Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act established uh, mandates to promote interagency coordination. Uh, the lead federal agency must coordinate the development of, it, of a interagency coordinated project plan that outlines uh, timelines for authorizations and consultations. Uh, the permitting timelines are posted to a public facing website, the permitting dashboard. And our implementation of FAST 41 requires coordination across uh, our divisions internally to ensure alignment of the Endangered Species Act, Essential Fish Habitat, and MMPA related consultations. Next slide, please. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.